So our guest tonight is uh, Sharon Terry. She's president and CEO of Genetic Alliance, an enterprise engaging individuals, families, and communities to transform health. Genetic Alliance works to provide programs, products, and tools for ordinary people to take charge of their health and to further their biomedical research. Uh, she co-founded the PXE International, a research ad advocacy organization for genetic condition PXE in response to the diagnosis of her two children in 1994. Not only did she discover the gene uh, that caused the disease, she subsequently developed a diagnostic test and conduct conducted clinical trials. She also led the coalition that was instrumental in the passage of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. She's been sat on several uh, organizations and has been awarded numerous, numerous awards. And we, she has a TED Talk that's out and hope everybody got a chance to listen to it. Very impressive uh, resume. And we are very excited to have you here with us today. So thank you for joining us. Great, thanks so much, Allie. Happy to be with you guys. Um, I am like you, uh, I think at least so far here, all moms and uh, perhaps we'll have some dads view the videos as well, but a parent basically. Um, my kids are now 35 and 33, um, uh, but were diagnosed in 94 with a what was supposed to be an adult onset disease. And in fact, we were able to diagnose it quite early. Uh, and I'm thrilled we were. I continue to argue that we should all get diagnoses as, as, as early as we can because we can do so much more. And I know that um, I, I saw the uh, video that Allie and her son put together for your world um, a conference, um, and it, it's, it really is well done and says a lot of the same things I'm going to say tonight um, and certainly maybe uh, add in a few things. So, um, I, I think our opportunity to identify these diseases early on makes a huge difference um, in um, FS, FSHD and in other diseases, there are the potential to manage the disease at least, and maybe to start to have some interventions that might mitigate some of the symptoms, make them easier to live with later in life. Uh, certainly, as we all try to work on how do we find the right endpoints or biomarkers or measures, uh, which are tough in rare diseases, it's better for us to have large communities of pretty, pretty much um, as early as possible um, uh, diagnosed individuals. And I'm working right now in a couple other diseases where we're actually doing in utero um, treatments for kids and they're born without a lot of the symptoms of the disease. So that too, I think is a really helpful thing. I think sometimes um, families get concerned with a couple of things. First of all, how to access genetic testing, for example. And it used to be, it was super hard to access it. And I um, was on the ground floor of, of um, helping some of the companies, GeneDx and Invite and even Prevention, all get formed um, in the 90s and, and early 2000s. And now it's not so hard to get testing. Sometimes it's hard to get clinicians to do testing. And I have a mini crusade for that as well, uh, that the undiagnosed get tested and that even when we suspect somebody has a specific condition, that we don't just say, oh yeah, they have that condition, but instead we actually do genetic testing because it's going to tell us much more care carefully and completely about a disease. Um, so access is an issue, payment is an issue. So um, that gratefully, I had a call this morning with one of the big genetic testing companies and they said because of legislative language in the Affordable Care Act and the recent appropriations for Congress, it's much easier to get testing, including what's called whole exomes, which are most of the material that makes up our genomes and something else called whole genome, which is everything. Um, that's all easier to get and easier to get paid for. Medicaid and Medicare lead the way a lot of times in payments and then Blue Cross and Kaiser and all the other ones follow and they have been following well. So that's, a re that's really good news in, in 2023. The next thing some people get concerned about is, but if I get my especially child tested, do they walk around the rest of their life with this sort of hanging over them as a, as a problem? And one of the things that Allie read in my bio is I worked for 12 and a half years 
educating the Congress about genetic information and genetic testing. And what we proved to them essentially was that we all should be able to have genetic testing and not have it impact our, either our health insurance or our employment. It's not a problem, obviously, for kids about employment, but often parents think about, well, when they're 16 or 18 and getting a job, will they be discriminated against? And the answer is no, um, it's not legal now. And it, it's been a real interesting law in that no one's violating it. Um, and, and the other place that there isn't any problem is health insurance. So a um, provider of health insurance like the Blue Cross Blue Shields and the Kaisers and the Intermountains and so on cannot raise the premium based on genetic test results. They can raise them based on symptoms, but that's a whole other story. And once symptoms occur, you're not even in the genetic testing category. You're in the symptoms that create higher premiums and so forth, unless you're in um, an employer group that, that you're protected. So it's complicated, um, but so far pretty safe. The one place that adults worry about is life insurance. Um, life insurance is not protected. And that's because life insurance is totally risk-based. We all know that if you go for life insurance, they're gonna ask, what do you smoke? Are you overweight? Is, does your family have heart disease in it? And they don't care about a genetic test or family history, whatever, wherever they got the information, they're gonna use it. And we tried to get it covered. Uh, but the bill would have never passed had we kept it in. In fact, the 12 and a half years slog was because we had that in, um, that and disability insurance. So I think the bottom line is us all as parents figuring out how we can get our kids tested early, understand the relationships between the mutations, because there could be overlaps with FSHD and other conditions, and we want to get those on, on our radar early. Um, and then also to uh, allow our kids in a really safe way to be part of research. So in a way that we control the data and it doesn't get sold and it isn't going to be going willy nilly everywhere, um, I think makes a big difference for how we can advance research on our, our kids' conditions. So I'm going to stop there because I don't want this to be a lecture and I do want questions because they're always the smartest way since they're yours and then they really address um, what you need. So I guess the most pressing issue is you seem to have gone from nothing. You, you discovered the gene and then you, you kind of just fast forward through it in your TED talk, but I know that it's not that easy. Um, we're working hard to try and get, there's, there's a few drugs in the FSHD world that are in phase two or three um, trials right now. And we're working very hard to get pediatrics involved. Um, and we're kind of bumping up a, against a wall about, you know, what they need for pediatrics and is it more risky and do we have the right data? Do we even need the data? Do we just need the endpoints? And I was just wondering, like, how you got all that accomplished on your own and and how did you kind of get your team around you and parents and things involved to get that done? Because I know it's it's very hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this was 1994 before the internet existed and I did silly things like put up billboards in Boston and stuff like that. Or I pretended there were conferences for the diseases called pseudoxanthoma elasticum and PXE means never say, having to say pseudoxanthoma elasticum again. Um, PXE, I pretended there were uh, conferences or uh, meetings all over the country and put in free calendar ads in every newspaper in the US. And I didn't have any conferences because I didn't know any people, um, but then people contacted me. So, um, so I think in this day and age, my work, because I run my disease group, but I also run this um, umbrella that Allie read about, which works to help organizations like yours figure out how exactly do we do this. And I think there's a couple of ways. One is I think getting the troops together means going to the places where parents wind up with FSHD symptoms, not even knowing that their kid has FSHD is one way. Another way is to go to the genetic testing labs and ask to be connected to parents. Some of them are trying to make a killing off that. You know, I went to one recently for another disease and they told me 
for $9,000 a person, they would tell that person about the support group. I mean, which is completely crazy and rare, to see. even in common diseases, that's crazy. So, so those would be two ways. Um, and I think then once we know each other, I think it's saying, you know, what are, what are the tasks we, tasks we can do together um, and how do we get the research community to be our collaborators? And in my case, I did a couple things in my, in my TED talk. I do kind of say this quickly. I, I basically say people told me researchers won't collaborate. The bread and butter is to compete. And I said, and they said, you can't hurt cats. And I said, you can hurt cats if you move the food. Um, so the food is data. And data, I mean, like, your impressions about living with a child with the disease, your electronic health records, wherever they are for, for your kid, um, your, any genetic information you do have, maybe from a genetic testing uh, panel or something like that, um, and, and blood and tissue samples. And so I built a blood bank and a biobank and I built a registry and then brought the researchers together and said, if you want any access to any of this, you have to play by my rules, which are that you share. So it was basically boys and girls in a sandbox with a couple trucks. And I said, you know, if you want to play with these trucks, you're going to have to share. And they did. Um, there were there were some knockdown drag out fight. And someday I hope I can write a book and expose some of them. Um, but meanwhile, I think it's saying to the research community, we're going to keep supporting you by giving you access to data. We're not going to sell it to you. We're not going to let people have it be that people don't have control of it anymore. Um, but we are going to give you access. And then, and then I feel like there is a snowball effect where we start to see some real changes in the behavior, both of us, the community, because we start to have some hope as well as the researchers. That's a long answer. Sorry, Ellie. <laughs> no, no, I understand. I get it. And in fact, we're, we're kind of going down that path now. Debbie, um, she's here. Um, hey, Debbie. She just put together a parent survey. And that's sort of the first, our first step is kind of collecting your data, getting that data and kind of controlling it and trying to get the researchers, like you said, that's easier said than done as well to, to work together and share the data because there are a lot of, there is a lot of data out there, but they're kind of in pockets and trying to get everybody together and yep. then to get everybody moving in one central, central way is, is difficult. Yep. But Devin, you want to jump in a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, your survey? Um, well, I mean, basically the information that we collected was to get an idea of what the symptoms are that um, most commonly seen by kids who have FSHD. And then we also wanted to um, find out, I guess, what we're willing to do to get treatment for our kids. So how far mm. can we, you know, do we feel like we can travel and, um, you know, what expenses parents can, can, um, can handle. And I can tell you that it's a group of people who will do whatever we can <laughs> to try to get treatments for our kids. I, it, I mean, when you do research, you don't, you shouldn't be, you know, expecting or I don't know, it, the research does what it does, but I was hoping to show that we really will do whatever we can. So, um, and that there are definitely some symptoms that are only experienced by a few people, but some of them, oh my goodness, almost all of them have it. So, yeah, yeah, that's fabulous. Um, and that's you, you went down the exact right track. I mean, there's, there's the one thing that the FDA wants to see something called patient focused drug development. It requires, we've been talking about, yeah. yeah, it requires you look at symptoms and treatments. Genetic Alliance has created a kind of toolkit to make that easy and to do it on the platform that we have so that the data is well protected, covered by GDPR, so the whole uh, world feels comfortable using it because there are different laws in different areas, including 18 states now that mimic the European laws. Um, so yeah, you're on, absolutely on the right track is to get a sense of those symptoms and get a sense of what, what treatments are already being used because sometimes it's surprising that there is something that's, that you know families are doing that are, is useful. And then also what, what would families do to get the right treatment? Mm -hmm. yeah, Can I ask you just go over one more thing that I, I feel like I'm not sure I totally understood you. Um, you mentioned two ways to um, get the 
um, data, the, you know, food for the cats. And the second one was the um, genetic testing um, information. The first one was, you had mentioned something about symptoms from adults, yeah. I think. Well, so either adults or kids, but to go where, um, where you think people might be um, gathering that have the symptoms uh, that you think are critical to identify pediatric patients. So, and that may or may not be applicable in your condition. I was trying to figure out if it, yeah, if that's something yeah. that would apply or not. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's really hard. Like PXC is an adult onset disease and lots more attention paid to the adults. Um, in, you know, in our case, we had a five-year-old, a seven-year-old with it, and they had classic symptoms in a sense, but they were ignored by the pediatrician for a couple of years. I was on a diagnostic odyssey till I finally just went out of plan, out of pocket. In those days, there was no HMOs and stuff like that. Um, and said, okay, now I need, need to find other parents who are seeing, in this case, a thing that looks like their kid's neck needs to be washed more. Um, and, you know, where am I going to find people like that? It's kind of tough. It isn't even like a symptom that's mm -hmm. specific enough for us to go to, you know, one kind of doctor, but obviously then dermatologists. So I went to the American Academy of Dermatology and, you know, talked to lots of dermatologists and we found more and more people and we found a lot of adults too, which was fine. Um, and now we have 5,000 people with the condition. It's one in a hundred thousand or so. Um, so pretty common rare disease. Um, but yeah, I think if there's anything that you would say, oh, parents might aggregate around a symptom they don't understand, mm -hmm. and sure, those won't all be FSHD diagnoses in the end, at the end of the day, but that's kind of the other cool thing about our platform. It's cross disease, and so then those people just sort themselves into other conditions once they've had testing and that sort of thing. So I think uh, PXE actually is more like FSHD than you might think because it really is very focused on the adults and and there are a lot of children that have it but don't show signs or, or very severe signs. So either parents don't notice or they sort of just know that they have it but just monitor it yep. because, because there's no treatment for it right now. I think once treatment again. So the, so the only thing I wanted to ask you is um, – you know, we're working really hard to get natural history studies and to get kids in clinical trials. Once we get, let's say we open a clinical trial, how, what's your best advice into getting the community involved to take in their kids to participate in the clinical trial so that we have enough kids? Did you ever have that issue where, you know, your kid might have it, but they're not, for whatever reason, don't want them to participate in the clinical trial? I think you're, I think she's frozen. Yeah. Sharon, Sharon, I think your uh, your camera froze. Oh, she's going and coming back. I guess while we're waiting for her, Elliot, it makes me think about you know where if we think about um, you know parents waiting for a clinical trial. So it's you know will we get them? To participate in a clinical trial, but it's also, you know, what we're trying to do right now is is get parents' attention for things before the clinical trial, even right. I mean, that's there are all these different stages to try to. Um, I'll go ahead and let you ask the question again. She's Did you hear my question, Sharon? Oh, she oh, froze wow. again. <laughs> Technology. Are you back? I think so. Okay, you are. You're back. <laughs> I'm tethering to my phone in metropolitan San Diego with uh, one gig up and down internet. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, sorry about that. So, Allie, you were saying. So, my question was, once you created the clinical trial, did you have any uh, problems getting parents to participate and to bring your, uh, to get there to the clinical trial? And then also, how did you get the attention of the pharmaceuticals in order to pay attention to your, to your trial and go through with it? Yeah, so a couple things. In PXC, we've not been able to get the trials uh, approved for PEDS um, because we have so few kids 
We have 5,000 people and we have about 80 kids at any one time. So we're going to have to go step two pediatric use because actually the drugs that we're testing in adults, the, the adults have already lost their vision. They've already lost circulation, the various uh, condition, parts of the condition. Um, and we're going to have to be treating like 12, 13, 14 year olds to make any difference. I have worked in a number of diseases though, where um, a couple different things. One is we, we're doing distributed clinical trials in pediatric populations. So in other words, as much as possible, doing the trial in the child's home medical institutions. Now, sometimes that's super hard because the FDA wants 16 specialists involved to measure you know, 25 things. And so you need a major academic medical center. But we're arguing more and more with FDA that you need the kid's pediatrician and or specialist that they normally see um, to be the one to um, see the kid and administer the, the drug in the trial. And more of that is happening. COVID helped us a lot because so much had to be moved into people's homes. Like we had a natural history trial in an epileptic um, condition that moved from Rochester, New York to everybody's home pediatrician. So that was great. Um, in, the, in the issue of trying to get drug companies involved, the best way I know is, again, using this platform we developed, we get a lot of pings from pharmaceutical companies who come to us and say, what communities do you have on the platform that are well, you know, at least engaged, uh, and then hopefully um, uh, also well characterized. So in other words, you know, we've got 100 families or 50 families and we have you know they've answered three surveys and they've connected their ehr because as i said you can do that and so then the companies are interested because they're the companies are really trolling for any community they could get participation from at this point which is so interesting compared to years ago where they only looked at the science they only wanted a certain condition a certain kind of science but now they're all repurposing drugs and they're you know as long as they get a captive audience that's going to be engaged and has been characterized a little, um, I find they're very, very engaged. And we get Genetic Alliance and our partner, Luna, that runs the platform inquiries probably once a week for which, po which populations are ready on your platform for us to, to go. And then we, you know, talk to the leaders of different communities that are active and they're the ones that we pick to, to go forward. So the FSHD Society is doing that right now. They're they're trying to put together a, a, a registry, so one kind of a one stop shop for pharmaceuticals or whoever to come, and, and they can reach out to um, to the patients. Um, I guess it's just um, I I'm just a little worried that even if we have the patients, are they are they willing and able to get to the clinical trials if, if they're available and doing all the stuff we need before the clinical trials to get ready. Right. Um, yeah. And I hope whatever platform FSHD society is using is one like ours that actually is advocating for all disease. And so when all these pharmaceutical companies come to us, we, you know, they come to us because we know a hundred of them, you know, I can text the CEO of a hundred companies and they come to us saying who's ready um, instead of, you just having or FSHD society having to beat the bushes. So yeah, I hope that whatever platform they're using is really helpful to advertising. Because I think as a army of all of us rare diseases, we have a much better shot at getting, you know, companies interested and so on. And then to your second part, yeah, I mean, what what we found is some of the companies are super traditional and they're saying, nope, everybody has to go to two centers in the United States. And you know, you're you're again back to the kids who had this KCNT1 epilepsy. They're seizing a hundred times a day, and you want them to get on a plane from San Francisco to Rochester, New York, you know, and they're four days old. Get, give me a break. You know, this is nuts. And finally, the company and the researchers heard that partly because they couldn't enroll the trials um, and knew they had to go to some kind of, you know, home based at. Um, at home sort of um, uh, system that would let more families participate. Yeah. So I find that since parents have gotten involved um, and I hear like I have, my son's been diagnosed for 13 years now, I think. 
but I really wasn't involved in this in this level of activity with the FSHC side. Kristen and I and Debbie and Barrett, all of us in this group has only been around for less than two years. But I feel like once the parents have started putting their voice into it, they're listening a little more. Do you find that, uh, can you kind of just let us know the impact that parents can make oh. on researchers and pharmaceuticals and, and the importance of that? Can you talk yeah. to that a bit? Yeah, it is the whole difference. So, you know, we could all... Uh, as leaders, for example, sing the song of it needs to be at home in people's where they live, work, play and pray, I like to say. Um, and it doesn't make the same difference as when the parents themselves start to be articulate about that in whatever ways. And certainly some of it is the kind of video you just made that shows a whole bunch of kids and the, their abilities and um, their the ways that they're challenged so that companies could understand, wow, for that kid to get to a trial and go seven times over the next 12 weeks or whatever the, the, the requirement is, is nuts. And so parents st making a statement about what they need and, and how they need it done makes an enormous difference. And I know sometimes as parents, we feel pretty powerless. I mean, we already have this enormous challenge of a disease in our kids. Um, we feel impotent in a certain kind of way that there's no way we can alleviate our child's suffering. And then I think the next phase or step, I hope, is that we see, wow, we really could make a difference even to an enormous pharmaceutical company that we think is, you know, impenetrable, I've found really changed their mind when they started to listen to the parents. And I have dozens of stories like that, hundreds of stories like that. So yeah, activating all of you, like the power you have is pretty amazing. And what about the FDA? How did, um, what was the FDA's role in all this? And how do we do we need to get their attention? I, I know at some point maybe we need to do a, a listening group for the pediatrics, but we need to have the right sorts of data and the right sorts of things to talk to them about. Did you ever, does your group do that or yep. can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I would do it sooner than later, Allie. I would say, you know, your group right here and then whatever other parents would come forward to, to start now and you have the seed in the survey Debbie did, and maybe to take that one step further and either use our platform or another one where you actually do it in a really structured way and have EHR with it. Um, even if it's 10 families, the FDA wants to hear and you have sort of laid the groundwork well before. I mean, one of the things I said from the start, and I came into this with a master's in religious studies and no scientific training. I was really proud. I had never taken a science course. Um, but what I quickly realized was that we got to stay way ahead of the curve. Like we, if we wait till a pharmaceutical company is interested in us, we're in trouble because the day they're interested, they're going to say the FDA is over here on my back and they want to know what's the burden of disease. How do you live with this condition? What do you do to, to mitigate the symptoms and you doing that now and doing even small, you know, you don't have to do a full blown FDA patient focused drug development. They, they make you put in a letter and wait a year before they say, yes, you can do it. We're doing them without their permission. And we're doing them on our platform, just saying, what are your symptoms? What are your treatments? What do you need? Um, and then, you know, writing a white paper that's three pages long with some testimonials from families that certainly will make clear statements about how hard it is to live with this with their kids really makes a difference. And that kind of preparation and maybe doing that every two years until there is a pediatric drug or a pediatric trial um, makes a difference. And again, we've been putting some kits together to make that easy because we don't want every group to have, you know, there are 7,000 groups. If we all reinvent the wheel, you know, that will be a lot of wasted time. So you have like an FDA listening kit. And so you're talking about like putting together a white paper, but like I put together a white paper, who do I know who to send it to or email it to, or who do I know who to get it to? Yeah. So basically what then, um, what then we help, we coach groups about is, so all the drug companies that are interested in any of the symptoms at all, even if it's way out there, they're interested in Parkinson's. Well, send it to them, you know, that sort of thing, because you never know whose attention you're going to, you're going to catch. Um, and then certainly publishing them on medium, you know, I mean, there's a lot of now methods for getting the word out or, you know, writing a really good, clear story and asking Huffington Post to post it, not so much because you're 
expecting a researcher will be reading Huffington Huffington Post, but to get attention and then, you know, that viral stuff really makes a difference for getting that word out. Um, and then, I, you know, I think the other thing is um, with other like conditions, so certainly FSHD society is one, but there are other ones that, you know, some of the symptoms overlap talking to those groups too and saying, you know, what companies are interested what companies are fishing for the right rare disease and they don't really care what disease it is. You know, that sort of stuff helps a lot. So we sort of know which companies to look at. Um, we have like two or three um, and we're, we're sort of trying to go down that path. Of, but um, I think, like you said, maybe, you know, in addition to some of the videos and I think pictures are powerful, especially when it comes to kids. Yeah, um, but maybe to get together a, a paper as well and just shotgunning it to the uh, to the pharmaceuticals. I know the FSHD Society has some connections there to the pharmaceuticals, and with this registry, I think they have they'll have you know patients coming to them. We just want to make sure that the pediatrics are included in it. And yep. you said you still haven't got gotten pediatrics into trials. What was your roadblock? Why? Why wouldn't they do it? Well, I didn't ask them because I have 5,000 people and only 80 are kids. And I don't think um, my battery's low. It's saying I'm going to try to switch to my real network in a minute. Um, I, I didn't think it was worth my going through the hoops for the pediatric indication until I get the adults tested, um, at, meaning testing the treatments that are available. In like other cases, like phase one and phase two, do you mean? Well, so we're in phase two with two drugs in adults. I think once I get these through in adults, and it's already hard because PXE doesn't have good endpoints, it progresses slowly over 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and nobody's going to do a 40 year clinical trial. Um, and I'll be dead before that finishes. Um, so my thought for PXE was let's just get this easier thing done. And then we, yes, we will, we will ask to test it in, you know, 10 year old to, to 18 year olds in other conditions though. Um, what we've, we've worked with the, with the advocacy groups to fight the FDA right away to have it done, the, the trial done, including pediatric patients or a PEDS trial. And that's, easier and easier too, partly because the FDA feels like it should be paying attention to women and children and, you know, other vulnerable groups and they're required to um, essentially. And so that's not as hard as it once was. Also with like, we're almost the opposite of, well, it's a progressive disease, but if, if kids get it early, like they, kids have it at birth, if they show symptoms early, normally it progresses a lot quicker. Yeah. So we're trying to make the case that if you if you get kids in clinical trials right away, you yeah. will get results quicker. Much yeah. better. And, and it's less it's less dosing because the kids are smaller. You're going to save yeah. money in time and dosing. Yep. Then if you've solved it for the kids because it progresses so much more quickly and get it quicker, then it will be available to the kids and the adult population. Yeah. I mean that's our that's our selling point that start with the kids. And you'll solve all everybody's problems and you get it done a lot quicker and cheaper. Yeah. And I think you'll be heard um, when you get to the right people. So, um, you know, I think there's really open minds at FDA about this. And then I think it's just getting the companies to accept the risks they feel are inherent in clinical trials. And it would depend on what companies you're working with, probably not on a recorded Zoom. Happy to talk to you about which companies and who I know in those companies that would be, you know, interested in listening to what you just said. Um, so I think that would be very useful. Is it, can I, Ellie, do you mind if I ask the question about the listening sessions? Please um, jump in. I don't want to, I don't want to go. <laughs> Sharon. Um, so I had talked to a mom who started a, um, an organization for a different rare disease. And I and I, I really didn't know anything about the listening sessions. And I was just looking here as you were talking about it at, um, at my notes here. And I'm just wondering, um, I, I guess I have a couple of questions. One thing that I remembered when that she was saying is that when you go, you have to have like a certain question or certain request. Um, so it wouldn't be, hey, pay attention to our kids with FSHD. It would be something specific that we're asking them to do um, 
as you had mentioned, you know, you, you could go several different times, but it's like each time you would have a different like request that you're asking. And then I'm going to ask both questions because it's possible I've sort of mixed things up and that way maybe you can clarify both. Um, but there's also the PFDD. And mm-hmm. so I'm just wondering, and I, and then I was kind of, I actually don't even know if I had given Allie and Kristen the scoop on this, but I feel like you know much more. So instead of me relaying it, maybe it would be better if you explain that. Cause I, I, it does seem, I mean, you're recommending we start doing something with that. And I feel like the better we understand it, the more we're going to get out of it. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying go to FDA a lot. They don't like that. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. yeah. I am saying whether it's a listening session that you create yourself uh, and they're not listening, obviously, cause they're not there, but they don't need to be there in this day of, you know, asynchronous communications. Um, so that that's one kind of thing. And you're right that you need a specific ask. You need to say there are trials going on for FSHD in adults in this particular, whatever therapy we want those in kids. Mm-hmm. Part of what the last there is, okay, do you have the drug company sign off? Are they in the eliciting session too? Maybe yes, maybe no. All that's interesting. Um, they'll probably say, do you have your kids well characterized? What are, are treatments are available right now? Part of that is answered by the patient-focused drug development uh, process. And the patient-focused drug development, again, you could either have an in-person meeting in White Oak, Maryland, where nobody can get, and I probably mm-hmm. shouldn't say this on a recorded thing, but you know, the first ones of those FDA did, they were surprised only 10 people showed up for certain ones of them. But People who are underserved, people who have kids who are sick can't go to White Oak. I mean, it's just impossible. There's no metro and so on. When they started to open it up a little, they said, you can do these, you know, you you make an application to them, they give you approval to do it, and you can do it on Zoom because COVID came and so forth. And sometimes the FDA comes and sometimes they don't. I'm of the mind that we don't need the FDA there. And that we don't need the FDA's permission to do patient-focused drug development. It's kind of like having mom or dad say it's okay for us to do something, and I askew that right away. I instead have built a toolkit so that any of our advocacy groups could do the the nuts and bolts, the guts of patient-focused drug development, and then give the report to FDA when it comes time. So FDA doesn't need that report until there is a trial and they want to hear, but what do people really want? Because the drug companies are required now to give FDA, what do people really want when they're doing the trial? So I'm suggesting either one of these things for you to do yourselves in preparation for the day when there is a clinical trial in a peds po- in your peds population, or you force the hand of, of um entities like the companies that are working now in the adult space to say, you've got to do this in, in, the, um, in, in children. There's even cases made for why are you not doing it in children? And FDA will ask that question of the company. Like if this group of people have shown that this disease progresses faster in kids with symptoms, you have quicker um, uh, assessment tools then to see whether or not a drug is useful and these kids need it. There's a huge unmet need here because it's 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 um, at least severely debilitating and maybe life threatening. Then FDA sometimes forces the companies to expand it to a pediatric population. So I'm suggesting you guys do a lot of kind of homework on your own because then you force the hand of either a company or the FDA or both, and you can you can go kindly to both and say, you know, here's what we have to offer. We've organized, we have enough people, kids, and we've characterized them to some degree so that we know here's our baseline, which comes out of probably EHRs, because you're probably not going to take the two years to do a natural history study in kids. It's it's too urgent to do that. Um, And FDA appreciates that. And there are really open minds at FDA about this now who would say, yeah, why aren't you doing this in kids, Biogen or Takeda or Pfizer or whoever's involved. But I can tell you that one of the things I did was to contact our representative and um, someone from her office responded and gave me information about a bill. I, I don't know if you know about this, but it's basically saying um, that, you know, previously 
you know, in order to protect children, they were trying to exclude them from trials. And maybe that was the wrong way to actually protect children that they need to have the opportunity. So I don't know if you're aware of that, but that's something I kind of wanted to check and see if anything's happened with that. But it sounds exactly like what you're talking about. Yeah. And thank goodness there are some legislative movements and the agencies, FDA and others, NIH, don't like it when the federal government's legislators get involved and tell them to do certain things. But patient-focused drug development's there because a bunch of us campaigned years ago now to say we need people's voices, we need real-world evidence, we need blah, 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 and those things got actually added to the remit of the agency. The, again, there are people at the agency who are really good listeners now who get it and who may have advice for you. There are also people who have left the agency and are good at advisors as well who were there and get it about, you know, what do we need to do to, to make sure that kids are, that peds are involved. But I would do a little bit ho of homework and you've started it, you know, your survey is a great step and then collect some EHR, collect more patient reported outcomes surveys and so forth, and then bring that data to the companies when the companies say, eh, we, we don't want to go there, it's too risky, or the biomarkers are not clear enough, the endpoints aren't good enough, um, then, then you might want to get regulators involved to say, hey, you gotta, you got to do this. Excuse me, so it sounds like many of the things we're doing is, is, is we're on track, I think. Um, yeah. Um, Kristen's really good at getting people together and, and, you know, beating down their door and making sure they understand that we're here. Um, and a lot of the things we're doing is, is just what you're suggesting. We're trying to get patient reported outcomes. We're working on the, so I feel like it's almost like we got to get all these things sort of together and, and be ready to go when the first when the first pharmaceutical says, okay, I'm, I'm ready to listen. And then we have all these things already sort of packaged and go, okay, here's our, our FDA listening. Here's our data. Here's all this stuff that we need and have it ready to go so that then we don't have to wait another. And that's the other thing we've been saying, like, we can't wait for the outcomes of the adults and then start with the kids because then it's going to be 10 years. Oh, and, okay. and if we wait that long, our kids are deteriorating too quickly. Yeah. So we just need to get all these things up front so that when a pharmaceutical does say we're ready to go, that we have all these things. And part of the problem is just, and we're getting better at that, thanks to Debbie as well, reaching out to the community. We're reaching out to more parents and they're getting more involved to say, yeah, we don't have a treatment right now, but you have to understand the process that it takes a lot of time. And, and the further we're ahead of it, the less time really it's going to take in the long run. And I think just education and getting the parents on board to understand that is something we've been working on. And I think the message is starting to get through. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing really terrific things. And I'd say also don't reinvent the wheel as much as possible. You know, our, our organization has tons of tools. Our platform does a lot of what we just described. There are probably other ones that um, are useful. My wariness with lots of the other ones is their business model is to sell data. In ours, no data is sold and you retain control of everything. So, but in any case, yeah, uh, exactly. Doing these sorts of things now and then at the same time, kind of pushing, you know, for when you can. And again, connecting with, you know, I'm happy to look at whatever companies you're involved with or their FSAD societies involved with and, see whether or not there's people that would be good listeners in those companies. So your organization, so if we wanted like this FDA toolkit and things like that, is there a cost involved in all this? I mean, I know, no? No, what which is, is a stupid business model on my part. Um, I'm constantly fundraising because we want to make this all really affordable to the, to the group. So the registry platform, which we run all these things on is free. Um, the, uh, the toolkit is going to be finalized this summer. I have a bunch of interns working on some of the final, uh, bells and whistles, uh, and that'll be available for free. There are things where we, where we do a step up, you know, there's a, a thing we call community driven innovation tool, and it combines all the kind of bells and whistles of 
a, a Delphi process focus groups. Um, and it isn't any of those things. It's using what's called computational social choice and ethnography and a whole bunch of very cool um, sciences that are all put together in the platform that costs. Um, and I don't remember how much because we don't, that's not something that we um, give you a, a subscription to. It's Luna, our platform company that does. And disclaimer, my son invented this. So I'm very proud of uh, his his capacity. Having grown up at a, for starting at age five at, at, uh, at medical conferences, trying to get somebody to look at his neck and see what PXE was. <laughs> Um, he now is actually writing tools that are amazing for all of us because he keeps telling me, mom, the goal is not to get a clinical trial or research. The goal, he has a five-year-old now, the goal is to sit on the couch, eat potato chips and watch Frozen with your kid. That's the goal. Um, and I appreciate that as being much more practical than, than my more short-term goal of trying to get a clinical trial. Well, I appreciate you. So, um, yeah, yeah, we'll definitely be reaching and, out. Ellie, yeah. I just have one quick question. Um, one thing that we have really run up against has been that you've got research doing their thing and you've got sponsors, pharmaceuticals doing their thing. Yeah. Um, and to get a roadmap from a family perspective or a parent perspective on what it is that we need to be doing to move the needle and not waste a lot of time because we're all working parents yeah. um how do you figure out what is those three things that are going to move the needle because what we're finding is research wants to just research and research and research and research and then the sponsors don't want to commit to anything they don't want to tell you how to do it or what needs to be done or what they're missing and so research runs around in a circle saying oh this is what they need this is what they need but it's never really been validated by the sponsors or industry um and then when you really get down to it you start hearing things like wait everything is actually a pharmaceutical's choice um and not dictated by the fda and not dictated by research and all of that and that they almost use each other as a way to scapegoat to not tell you what is actually needed is that what we're is that like the synopsis that we're up against yeah and that's that's the herd the cats that i faced a jillion years ago and are it's clearer now anyway um <clears throat> and there's more opportunity because in 1994 there were like two companies doing rare disease research and now everyone wants to do it because they've lost their blockbuster model and they want to make a killing on a rare disease drug instead so great question Kristen. and i think what you need to do is make sure that you guys are in the driver's seat and what that entails is essentially figuring out, yep, researchers do want to run around in the circles. They do because they want an NIH grant, probably, maybe an FDA grant, but at least NIH grants. And so they're going to do whatever they'll need to do to get one of those. It doesn't matter if it leads to the right solutions for you. And sponsors are going to run around in a circle trying to read FDA's mind, because you're right, FDA does not control what they do. In fact, FDA, I'm finding, is more and more interested in novel and innovative N of one trials, repurposing, you know, prescribing a drug to a bunch of kids and collecting the data if the drug is already available somewhere else and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I find it's up to us and it's a shame and here's a place we need legislation. I think we're the freaking army that gets stuff done in this country. And I would say that much more explicit with a lot of more expletives if it wasn't being recorded and I wouldn't offend some people. Um, we're who gets it done and we're going to stay the glue in the center. And so for us, I think it's saying lovely little researcher over there doing this thing that, you know, who cares? It's never going to result in anything and i need you to do this too so they still need to do that thing that will get them an nih grant that has nothing to do with a clinical impl implementation but i need them to do this too and the, this too can be huge or small and eventually some of them come around especially younger ones saying well actually you're going to be more my source for getting the data i need to get the grants i need and then the companies you know, some examples of that are we've sat down at tables with companies who said, um, and I, I'll use the, the story of Biogen with, with KCNT1 epilepsy, because we actually have a published case study on this that I'm happy to send you. They sat down at the table with, with moms and dads of people, of kids with KCNT1 epilepsy. These kids seize 100 times a day, as I said. And what Biogen said is we need to reduce the number of seizures. And what the parents said is, we don't care how many seizures a day they have. 
We care that they could look us in the eye and take a cookie. We care that they could start to crawl, maybe walk. And doing this community-driven innovation thing that my son in invented, what we discovered where there were families who had found solutions to some of these issues. And one of them was injecting the kid's salivary gland with Botox because they stopped drooling then and they could sit up and they could walk and they could crawl and those sorts of things. They weren't choking. Another one was a certain kind of tea, uh, over-the-counter tea that reduced constipation and reduced the number of seizures. So they were not major therapeutic in interventions. Biogen was not interested in those things. They still wanted to do their work um, to reduce the number of seizures and they're still doing those trials. But what they did is we said on the way, you need to support the advocacy group to then be able to educate the parents about Botox, about tea. It turned out a medical pillow helped to, um, that those things were important for quality of life. And then those parents will stay more involved and more uh, po possibly more involved in your trials. And Biogen bought it. They were wonderfully magnanimous about supporting the advocacy group to do those things because then they knew they would get the families caring to stay in the trial to go, you know, you're right. It'll be 10 years before these kids have this drug and some of them die before that. So, so I think for you, the, it's a fabulous question and you need to keep figuring out how do I let everybody stay in their um, silos and do what they need to do. Basically we call those misaligned incentives. They're incentivized by something different, all of them. And how do we capitalize on or make the most of the very small places where they overlap and we get what we want to then drive toward the solutions we want? So it's a fairly complicated dance, but I feel like you guys have some of the main ingredients already and you just need to push those with confidence a little farther and maybe make a couple demands as you go. You hit on something that's interesting. I was just, um, you know, been diving more and more into the AI end of things um, and taking all of that patient information and throwing it through uh, AI uh, generative databases. Is, is that the the best way that you come up with those types of solutions for families? And but you need the sponsors or or somebody, an advocacy group, or the sponsors to actually get the yeah. to sponsor the technology, go through the mountains of information that people are publishing on, on Medium or Facebook or anywhere else? Yeah, I think some of it's AI. Uh, some of it's as simple as this tool that my son created, and I'm sure there's others I'm not aware of, that then suss out what is it that families are doing. I mean, that those three things rose to the surface really fast when he, that, that community only has about 100 families. That would be interesting. Yeah, I'd love to take a look at that tool. Yeah. And there, there soon will be a paper that will be out that will explain it um, as well, because he finally put it into sort of an academic paper format. Because that's the other thing is we're playing kind of many sides of this, of this game, right? We're playing that we want to serve our families and have them know that we hear them day to day and what they're living with, the lived experience. There's nothing else, really. That's the client customer. At the same time, we have to speak the language of this, these researchers and these sponsors because they have to speak in certain languages. So publishing papers, you know, I, I didn't want to publish any papers and I have 140 peer-reviewed papers because I know <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> unless I write them, you know. So um, yeah, so so figuring out how do we... I mean, that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> There we go, Debbie. I just and, called Joe over because he's a computer engineer. I'm like, I heard AI. I'm like, Joe, come over and listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that's so, a huge job. So I think AI is going to help us hugely, which is great. And I think we're still going to need, you know, those of us who actually will sit and look at data and figure out we're seeing something here. Stuff, noise has settled down and, and we're hearing a signal that's important. Can you just, Sharon, can you say the name of your um, son's um, company again or tool? Yep. Luna, so the company's uh, online presence is lunadna.com. It's not really all DNA. Um, they're sorry that it says that. Um, but the platform is Luna DNA, owned by the people who share the data, overseen by a company, Luna PBC, which is Public Benefit Corp. And then his tool is called Community Driven Innovation CDI. Um, and we have a couple of um, fact sheets on it. The paper's not out yet. It's in, in review. 
Um, but I'm happy to share the case studies and the fact sheets on it. Yeah, I would love that. And then that's Joe's responsibility, Debbie. <laughs> Somebody email me to remind me anything I promised you. <laughs> Okay, I will. And so we can we just go oh, this is gonna be my next question. Just email you or should we go on your website to request this kind of stuff or can I just come no. straight to you? Okay. Um and the other thing I'm glad you mentioned this about your son creating creating this product because he's been involved in all of this since the beginning. And I and we have been saying that for a long time too. It's powerful for kids to get involved and to be part of the solution. And I think that empowers them, gives them, you know, they have the most at stake in this, but also it gives them a purpose. And um, I think it's really important. And look at how well your son's doing. I think it's really important for all the parents to hear that. Yep, absolutely. And your video, you know, it, you were eloquent and said all the right stuff. And your son saying what he said at the end and the little girl at the end, man, you know, give me a break. There, nobody can say no. I mean, that's, that's just. Well, and CM did so much for that too. So it's, that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really beautiful. And you're absolutely right that, that the kids being involved and it ultimately, I mean, both my son and daughter have been involved in the stuff I've done and they've renovated my thinking, the way we do stuff, you know, they're not stuck in these old models where we go, Ooh, can't say anything. Cause FDA said they're like, so what, you know, let's walk forward and see what happens. And it's quite amazing. Well, I don't want to take up all your time. You've been very generous with your time. Does anybody else have any last minute questions before we go? I have one last one. Um, when you're dealing with when you're dealing with a point where you want to pull together researchers and pharmaceuticals to try and better understand what it is that everybody needs to take that mystification of like running this one says this, this one says that, let's get them all into a room and let's like box it out. Um, are those beneficial? Are they, you know, do you feel like over the course of the work that you've done that the, you get more done when you can put a summit together that's focused for two solid days and you have researchers and sponsors in the same room and you walk away with plans? Yes. And I do that once a year now and I do it on Zoom now because when COVID came, we used to alternate between Europe and the US every other year find a sponsor to pay the enormous costs of bringing. Uh, we don't have a lot of researchers in PXE, so it's a total of 40 people in the meeting, um, e either sponsors or researchers. And now we just do it online and it's been very beneficial. And then sometimes I take a subset of them and say, you know, we've, we've got to duke it out around what even the diagnosis is or what are the endpoints or whatever. And then I put together working groups and we work every month together on Zoom. It helps a lot because people start to get to know each other and they start to care more. They, we also weed out the ones who are only in it to you know, get a grant or make a buck and they don't stick around and that's fine because the other ones do start to trust each other. Because the other thing we've been able to do now after you know, we've been doing this 28 years, the first few years are really hard. Ask people to, to share unpublished data, data with a cone of silence over the meeting, nobody could run out of the room and publish it, um, was hard. And maybe four or five years in of doing that, people felt like, oh, I, yeah, I can trust the people in this room and I can tell you my pain points and my problems because maybe one of you can help me. And these alliances were formed that were pretty amazing between the sponsors and the researchers. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. And Sharon, we will be in touch and if we get this summit together, Maybe we could talk to you about, like, what are the top three things that we really need to, to focus on and get, come away from these with so that we can have some actionable items so that we're not just talking and talking and we're actually getting some stuff done. So I will certainly be in touch with you, and I'm sure Kristen will as well. And we'll get some of these tools and we'll pick your brain on what's the best way to um, get the most bang for our buck out of these, these sorts of meetings. Yeah, wonderful. Happy to help. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure meeting you. Um, you too. You've done some incredible work. So thank you so much. Yeah, I'm glad and you. I'm so happy that you're willing to share all that with us. It means the and, world. And let us know about your fundraising stuff as well. <laughs> yeah. so, okay. you know, nobody should right. work for free. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you guys. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure meeting you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.